Well, good afternoon. Um, welcome everyone. And thank you so much for taking time out of your busy day uh, to join us uh, for this lunch with Mia, uh, the Maryland Insurance Administration. My name is Patty Dorn and I'm going to be your moderator today. Today, we have three sets of questions that myself and my colleague, Gia Wilkerson, are gonna ask the rapid response staff of our agency. Our rapid response program is designed to help Marylanders resolve their property and casualty claims. So those are such as auto or homeowners claims. The rapid response program is designed to resolve them quickly and without you having to file a formal written complaint. Um, the participation in this program is voluntary and it does not affect your rights to file a formal complaint with us. Today, Gia and I are gonna ask the team questions about homeowner's insurance to start. So why some damages to your home are considered maintenance and they're not damages that are covered by your homeowner's insurance. We're also gonna ask questions to help you understand the process when your vehicle is declared a total loss by your insurance company. And then the last set of questions is gonna be some questions about auto insurance and using your vehicle to earn extra cash. Um, for this program, we'd like you to leave your video and your phones on mute. We will take your questions at the end in the chat box. At any point during the program, you can put those questions into the chat box, but we will read through them at the end. Reading through the scenarios should take us about 30 minutes. And so for starters, uh, we're gonna have Gia and Mary Jo. Good afternoon. Bill purchased a new home in July of 2020. In August of 2021, he noticed a crack in his ceiling. There were no watermarks or signs of a leak. A few days later, the ceiling collapsed. He contacted his insurance company and a claims adjuster came to his property. After the inspection, the adjuster determined that the drywall had been installed incorrectly. The claim was denied for poor, faulty workmanship. Cheryl, Bill does not understand why the claim was denied. He has only been in his home for a little over a year and had an inspection at the time of settlement. He feels that there is nothing he could have done to prevent the collapse. Well, there's actually specific language in most insurance policies that exclude collapse unless it's as a, as a result of a covered peril. So an example of a covered peril might be a tree falling on the home during a storm, which would cause the collapse. In this case, the adjuster determined that the drywall was installed incorrectly, which, be, which, be, which would be considered a workmanship issue. And therefore it's not something that's covered under the policy. So, and you know, it's possible that the inspector that performed the inspection at the time the home was purchased may not even have noticed the workmanship flaw. Um, it could have been as simple as the contractor driving the screws in too deep in the drywall or not allowing um, a, an eighth inch space for expansion and contraction, which can cause cracks in the drywall and inevit inevitably a failure and or a collapse. Okay. Doug and Shirley noticed water stains on their living room ceiling just below their master bathroom. There were no signs of water leaking in the master bathroom. They contacted a plumber to assist them in locating the leak. The pl plumber determined that the leak was coming from behind the shower wall. He removed the shower enclosure and found a small leak in the water line. The water damaged the wall and the subfloor under the shower pan. Doug and Shirley contacted their insurance company and filed a claim. The claim adjuster came to their home to review the damages and observe mold, rot, and deterioration of the subfloor. The insurance company determined that the leak was ongoing and denied the claim. Murray Jo, Doug and Shirley had no idea the pipe was leaking since it was behind the shower wall and they reported it as soon as they saw the stain on the wall. Why is the leaking pipe not covered by their insurance? The uh, homeowner's insurance policies only cover losses that are considered sudden and accidental. In this case, the leaking pipe was considered long-term and therefore the damage it caused was not covered regardless of when it was discovered and reported. The insurance company is relying on the fact that there was rotted wood and mold to show this was not sudden. So are leaking pipes ever covered by insurance? Leaking pipes are not covered by an insurance policy. 
it's considered a maintenance issue and is responsibility of the homeowner. However, if the burst pipe suddenly with ensuing water damage, that's probably going to be covered. However, the cost to repair the pipe is not covered. A severe storm hit Maryland with high winds and hail. The next day after the storm, Nicole noticed some shingles in her yard. She contacted a roofing contractor to inspect her roof. He advised her that she had major wind damage and was missing shingles. He stated that her roof would need to be replaced. He advised her to contact her insurance company. She reached out to the insurance company and an adjuster came to do an inspection. The adjuster determined that her roof was repairable the roofer spoke with the adjuster and explained why the roof needed to be replaced and the insurance company is still refusing to replace the roof and only want to repair it. Cheryl, why isn't storm damage to a roof covered by an insurance policy? So um, Gia, storm damage um, is covered under, under the policy. Um, in this case, the adjuster determined that the roof is repairable. Um, so the insurance company would be responsible to repair the damage. So the, you know, the issue of repair versus replacement is often a difficult dispute to, to resolve. Um, but it, it's something if, if the uh, complainant is not satisfied with the insurance company's decision, it can be reviewed by the um, rapid response per program here at the Maryland Insurance Administration. Okay, so can you tell me why the insurance company is only paying to repair the roof and not for a full replacement as recommended by the contractor? Her roofer told her that the undamaged shingles are beyond their lifespan. She has 20 year shingles and the roof is 27 years old. Furthermore, if they only replace the damaged shingles, they won't match and may even lower the value of her home. Well, most insurance companies will only pay to repair the portion of the roof that was directly damaged by the storm. So the contractor you know, may be correct that it's time for Nicole to purchase um, I'm sorry, I had a sound issue there for a second. Um, it, it's um, that the contractor may be correct that it's time that, that Nicole purchase a new roof, but it would not be responsibility of the insurance company since the roof was already past its reasonable life expectancy. The policy would not um, replace shingles that are worn or aged. That would be considered maintenance. They would only replace them as a result of the storm. So and some insurance companies offer a mismatch endorsement for an additional premium. This type of endorsement provides coverage for replacement of old material with new materials for a more uniform appearance if the old shingles are no longer available. So uh, they should talk to their insurance producer or company representative to see if this endorsement is available uh, and it's, it's right something that they would like to purchase. Thank you, Cheryl. Jack discovered water on his basement floor. Upon further inspection, he found mold, mildew, and rot so Jack put out fans to dry the area and contacted a plumber to determine where the water was coming from. The plumber determined that the water was coming from his AC condensate line. The line had clogged, causing it to overflow. He called the insurance company and submitted the bills from the plumber and the damages. They denied the claim. Murray Joe, can you tell me why the claim was denied and why aren't they paying the plumber? Well, first of all, even if this is a covered loss, a sudden... Um, accidental water loss, the insurance company would not pay for the plumber to repair the pipe, or if it was a leaky appliance, they would not pay to repair or replace the leaky appliance. But again, based on the mold and rot and deterioration that they observed when they inspected his home, that indicated that this was a long-term ongoing leak. And again, that would not be something covered by a homeowner's policy. But Jack feels like he took the necessary steps to prevent further damage to his home by placing fans and by a dehumidifier. Shouldn't that be covered under his policy? It is always the homeowner's responsibility to take steps to prevent further damage to the property after a loss whether it's covered or not covered. But because this was not a covered loss, it was considered maintenance, therefore the insurance company would not owe anything on this claim and his expenses would not be covered under the policy. Thank you, Mary Jo. Mm -hmm. 
Thanks, Gia and Mary Jo. Um, Cheryl and I are going to go forward with some total loss scenarios. And I have several questions for you, Cheryl. Um, so first one, Travis parks his vehicle on the street in front of his house. When he was sleeping, another driver smashed into his vehicle. The at fault driver's insurance company deems the vehicle a total loss. They have made a settlement offer, but it isn't close to what Travis feels the vehicle is worth. The insurance company said that they came up with that value from a CCC report. So what is a CCC report and how can Travis dispute the value? Well, CCC is the Certified Collateral Corporation. So it's a third party data reporting agency that some insurance companies use to come up with the fair market value of the vehicle that's been considered a total loss. So it analyzes vehicles for sale in the proximate area marketplace uh, and it develop a, an actual cash value of the vehicle. So the actual cash value is the amount of the, ve the vehicle is worth in the marketplace before the accident actually occurred. Um, CCC usually will take about six to eight market comparable vehicles and then adjust the value to make them more comparable to the actual loss vehicle, such as um, add-ons, running boards, trim package, and that type of thing. Um, but since Travis disagrees with the value the insurance company is offering, he can do his own research of comparable vehicles that CCC may not have considered, and then he can present them to the insurance company for consideration. Thanks. All right, so what about this? Travis already gave the insurance adjuster the Kelly Blue Book value report, and the insurance company said it's not going to change the offer, even though the retail price that he found was higher. So he paid a lot more for the vehicle than the insurance company is offering, and he can't replace this car for what they're offering. Doesn't the insurance company have to pay to replace this car? So the simple answer is no. The insurance company does not pay replacement value of the vehicle. It owes fair market value of the vehicle. So KBB, which is Kelly Blue Book, is a guide used to provide approximate value of new and used vehicles. Um, there's a trade-in value, a private party value, and when you purchase from someone other than the dealer, and then there's the retail value. And the retail value is the amount you can expect to pay from a dealer, which is typically a, a bit more. Um, and most vehicles depreciate between 15 to 20% a year. So depending on the model and the demand, the chances are that Travis's vehicle has depreciated and will not be worth what he paid for it. Um, there are many factors used when determining the actual cash value of the vehicle, which includes mileage, vehicle conditions, and, and prior accidents. Thanks. All right, next question for you. Keith was involved in an accident with his custom 1969 Camaro. He lost control on an icy road and he hit a tree. Keith had full coverage on the vehicle. The insurance company keeps asking him questions about where he kept the car, why he was driving it, et cetera. And the insurance company is taking weeks to make him a settlement offer. So how much time does an insurance company have to make a settlement offer? And also why is the insurance company asking so many questions about why he was driving it? He pays his premiums and it's his car. Right. Well, so um, the first question, so under, under Comar, Comar is the Code of Maryland Regulations. An insurance company has 10 days to make a settlement offer if it determines that a motor vehicle of the first party claimant is a total loss. So the first party claimant would be uh, Keith. Keith. Um, so it, it must make the, the cash settlement offer for retail value for the substantially similar vehicle from a nationally recognized valuation manual or computerized database that, that processes fair market value. Um, however, if there's a dispute over the obligation of the insurance company to pay a claim, it may take longer. So uh, for example, if the custom antique vehicle was listed as a, a weekend only pleasure vehicle and the accident occurred at 11 o'clock at night on a Tuesday, the insurance company might need to determine if the vehicle is properly rated and eligible for coverage. Um, in addition, since the vehicle is a limited edition um, specialty and it's older than 10 years, it, it'll be more difficult to determine the value and this can also delay the settlement offer. Thanks, Cheryl. Next question. 
Lori was in stop and go traffic when another car cut in front of her, hitting her passenger side door and her front bumper. The driver of the other car took off and she was not able to get the license plate number. So the insurance company is saying that her vehicle is a total loss. Her brother, who works at an auto body shop, says that he can fix it. So my question to you is, why is the vehicle a total loss? Uh, she went on NADA's website and her vehicle is worth more than what the insurance company is using to determine that it's a total loss. So NADA is another um, reporting agency. It's the National Automobile Dealer um, Association. It's another guide that's used by auto dealers as well as the public to obtain the value of new and used vehicles. Um, and it can be used to determine the value of substantially similar vehicles based on its condition. Um, in addition, um, she could be able to find specific value of the vehicle using the VIN number. Uh, VIN number is the vehicle identification number on all vehicles. So generally the insurer will consider a vehicle to be a total loss if the estimated repair to the vehicle exceeds the 75% value of the vehicle. Um, so even if the repair estimate is below 75%, the insurance company may still make a business decision and determine Sorry, I'm having a sound problem again. Sorry. Can hear um, you. <clears throat> sorry, can you still hear me? Okay, even if the repair uh, is below that 75%, the insurance company may still make a business decision and determine the vehicle to be a total loss um, based on the potential hidden damage that could exceed that 75% threshold, as well as the cost of, of rental or temporary transportation that would be incurred during the time the vehicle was being repaired. Okay, so Cheryl, she says, the insurance company says that she can buy her vehicle back. So why would she have to buy her own vehicle back? Well, it's not necessarily a buyback. The actual term is to retain salvage. So the salvage value um, is the value that will be received if the insurance company sold the vehicle to a salvage yard for its parts and its frame. So when a vehicle is determined to be a total loss, um, the responsible insurance company has an obligation to pay the ACV or the actual cash value and include the title fees and, and tax. The insurance company settles the claim for the full amount and the salvage becomes the property of the insurance company. So um, the vehicle owner can choose to retain the salvage. Uh, if the vehicle owner chooses to retain the salvage, then the insurance company will reduce the settlement amount by the salvage value of the vehicle. So in this situation, the vehicle would require a, actually a, a salvage and a branded title. Okay, um, so for starters, I mean, can you talk a little bit about what a salvage title is? And then also, is this gonna be a situation where she can't get insurance on the vehicle now that it's been repaired and it has this salvage title? So a salvage title is a branded title um, with an official indication that a vehicle has been damaged and it's been considered a total loss by an insurance company. Um, so Laurie would be able to get a certificate of title in the vehicle once she has the vehicle repaired and inspected. Um, and she'd be required to get a safety inspection certificate by a, you know, a, a, a licensed inspection station. Um, but she can, she can consmit, uh, submit that to the MBA and it'll be issued with a corrected title with a notation. It'll say rebuilt salvage. Um, and she will also have a, a corrected title showing owner retention. Um, she'll be able to obtain coverage on the vehicle with most insurance companies. Um, however, the cost might be a little bit higher than the comparable vehicle without the salvage history. Um, and she might not be able to get a collision coverage. So it only, it'll be liability only. Uh, but she should talk to her agent or her current insurance company in that regard. Thanks, Cheryl. Uh, that wraps up this set. So we're going to welcome back Gia and Mary Jo for our last set. Thanks, Patty. Bob and Melissa's son, Justin, started a part-time job delivering pizzas for their neighborhood pizza shop. He had an accident while delivering pizza and struck another car. The other car a 2021 BMW was deemed a total loss and Justin was at fault for the accident. Bob and Melissa's car, a 2019 Honda Pilot, also suffered significant damage and had to be towed from the scene. The repair estimate for their car is over $8,000.
Bob and Melissa carry collision coverage on the vehicle Justin was driving. Mary Jo, when Bob and B Melissa filed a claim for the damage to their car, coverage was denied even though they carried collision coverage. Why did their insurance company deny coverage for this loss even though they paid for collision coverage? The insurance company may deny coverage in this case. Generally, a private passenger auto insurance policy, in that policy, the terms state that coverage will not apply if the loss occur occurs while the vehicle is being used for commercial purposes, such as delivering food or goods. Bob and Melissa should have notified their insurance company or agent to obtain coverage, which would have included collision coverage, um, while the vehicle is being used for commercial purposes. Although the change would have most likely resulted in a higher premium, uh, their loss would have been fully covered. So they also carry $250,000, $500,000 in bodily injury coverage and $100,000 in property damage coverage. The owner of the BMW did file a claim against their policy for his vehicle, as well as a bodily injury claim in the amount of $50,000. The car, which was deemed a total loss, was valued at $42,000. Bob and Melissa were informed that their insurance company will only pay $15,000 for the damaged BMW and $30,000 for the bodily injury claim. Why doesn't their insurance company have to pay the full cost of the other party's claim since they carry significant coverage amounts? Once again, the commercial use of the vehicle at the time of the accident means that Bob and Melissa have less coverage available than they thought. The exclusion in the policy regarding commercial use means only limited coverage is available. In Maryland, mandatory insurance regulations do not allow the insured to deny all coverage for the other party's claim, but the insurer is allowed to reduce the available coverage limits to the state's minimum liability requirements of $30,000 per person, $50,000 per occurrence, and fifth for bodily injury and $15,000 for property damage. So the other person's insurance policy apparently covered the balance of the claim under something called underinsured motorist coverage. Now that insurance company has filed a suit against Bob and Melissa for the balance of the money owed. Is this legal? Yes. The other insurance company may take legal action to recover the full amount that it paid on the claim. They may file suit and potentially obtain a judgment against Bob and Melissa, which may result in garnishment of their wages or liens on their property. Daryl lost his job during COVID and he is considering signing up with DoorDash to make some money. His friend Josh told him that was a bad idea because he would need to purchase a separate insurance policy on his car because he was using his car for a commercial purpose. Josh told him that if he did not have a separate policy on this car, and if he were in an accident, his insurance company would deny the claim. Marjo Darrell wants to know if Josh is correct that he has to purchase a separate policy on his car. The answer will depend on the specific terms of Darrell's policy. Most private passenger auto insurance policies do not cover for losses that occur if the vehicle is being used for commercial purposes, like delivering people or goods for a fee. This applies to all coverages. Daryl should talk with his agent before he signs up to figure out if he is covered. And if not, he should ask what he needs to do to obtain the proper coverage. So is it any different if he drives for Uber or Lyft? His friend Jennifer told him that he can get a policy directly from Uber or Lyft that will cover if he is in an accident. Daryl still needs to check the terms of the policy carefully. Some of these policies focus on whether you are waiting for an assignment, driving to pick up a passenger, or actually having a passenger in your vehicle. 
So Jake signed up to drive for Uber to earn some extra cash. While driving a client, he was involved in an accident, which was not his fault. Someone texting failed to see he had stopped for a red light and rear-ended his vehicle, which was sub subsequently declared a total loss. He filed a claim against the other party's insurance company who accepted liability and made him an offer to settle his claim. After some back and forth negotiation, they received, reached an agreement on the value of his vehicle and he received a settlement. Unfortunately, Jake was upside down in his auto loan and owed more than it was worth. Luckily, he bought gap coverage through his finance company, but when he filed a claim, his finance company told him the contract did not afford coverage if the loss occurred while using his car for commercial purposes. Marjo, can they deny his claim? Gia, first of all, let's talk about gap coverage. There are two types of gap coverage. One is gap insurance, and this is an insurance policy that you purchase through an insurance company. The second type of gap coverage you purchase oftentimes when you're buying the car, um, and this would come from the dealer, from your loan company, credit union, the finance company. That is a debt cancellation warranty. It's not actually insurance. Either way, whatever type of gap coverage someone may have, you may want to check the terms of that gap coverage to see if there's any exclusions for when the vehicle is being used for commercial purposes. So if there is, you may want to think about using your car for commercial purposes because if there is an exclusion, your gap coverage will not apply. Okay, thank you, Marjo. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Gia and Mary Jo. Um, this is the, I'm gonna start the Q&A portion. And so far, I don't have any messages in the chat. So if anyone has any questions for either Cheryl or Mary Jo, um, I'll give everybody a minute or so to put those questions in the chat. If you have anything, please feel free. Um, and while I'm waiting, I'm just going to say a couple other things about some upcoming events. We have the Maryland Insurance Administration has a listening session um, on health insurance issues for people with disabilities. It's an opportunity for Marylanders, Marylanders who have signed up to speak, um, to speak to us about issues that they see with health insurance um, and how you know, that might be affecting folks with disabilities. That's gonna be on Tuesday, November 16th from 1 p.m. until 3.30 p.m. If you are interested in tuning in and listening to this listening session, uh, that information is on our webpage. And then also on November 18th, we have living with diabetes and having the proper insurance coverage. That's gonna be a one hour program and it's gonna be Thursday, November 18th, if anyone is interested in that. Um, and so with that, it doesn't look like anyone has any questions. And so I'm just gonna say thanks to Gia and Mary Jo and Cheryl. Um, one other thing, we would really appreciate it uh, if you could complete a survey. We do have a quick survey in the chat. Um, it would be great if you had a moment to give us some feedback. I think that this is a, it's a new and interesting way for us to present insurance information to the public in the form of these scenarios. You know, it's a little bit different than sitting through a presentation or something like that. And it's a little bit new to us. And so we would appreciate any feedback that you have about this Lunch with Mia program. So that link is in the chat. And I just want to say again, thanks, Mary Jo. Thanks, Cheryl. Thanks, Gia. And hope to see you all at events in the future. Thanks so much, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Thanks. <laughs> Bye.